Erev Tov, Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Don't know whether or not this is going to be a major story tomorrow or not, but there's about 200 foreign general, journalists right now in North Korea. And foreign journalists in North Korea have been told to prepare for a big event tomorrow. Now, tomorrow marks the 105th and a birthday anniversary of the founding president, Kim, uh, uh, the second sung on April 15th, North Korea's biggest national day called the Day of the Sun. And of course, before the, uh, the uh, North Korean officials have spoken about there going to be a big event the following day, and it's really not that big of a deal to start with. But in light of all the tensions that are going on in North Korea, there are some that are concerned that North Korea may very well use that opportunity uh, to send out some nuclear weapons in different directions, including the United States, Japan, South Korea, and other places uh, as a possibility. I uh, don't know for sure as of right now how that's going to play out. That There again, that's only a conjecture, so we'll have to kind of wait and see what comes of that. Also, Sean Spicer, he has apologized for the statement that he made earlier about uh, uh, Hitler did not use chemical weapons. But uh, I will play this just for a second so you can hear his statement here. We chemical weapons in World War II. You know, you had a, you know, someone as despicable as Hitler who didn't even sink to, the, to, the, to using chemical weapons. Of course, that was a uh, good thing he did apologize. But my concern is, is it plants the seeds in the public. How many people will actually have taken the time to find out later he did apologize for this type of a statement because Hitler killed millions using cyclone gas. Uh, he may not have stuck it in a missile and dropped it anywhere, but I don't think that Bashar al-Assad did either. I think that what was laying there in the Kim, or in the, uh, the factory below, as Russian uh, intelligence is reporting, is that the, uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda uh, members that were fighting there in that region that also have a stronghold there in Al Nusra, that they were actually storing sarin, sarin gas. And of course, another thing that's been brought out, we brought it out yesterday on Israeli News Live, and that is the oddity that each time, uh, for the two times that the sarin gas has been used inside of Syria there, uh, there's been visits by John McCain just before, about a month before a 2013 attack, and as well about a month before this attack here. Is it a coincidence? Well, there are some that seem to think that it's not a coincidence. We'll won't go into that at this point right here, but just to kind of throw that out there for you. Uh, another interesting thing that is going on that I want to share with you before we go into the meeting of Sergey Lavrov and that of uh, 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 Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, and even the fact that President Putin supposedly is meeting with the Secretary of State as well, seeming that the meeting went somewhat good there. Um, and that is, um, sorry, I actually got too much stuff in my comment section here. I want to run over to Lorenzo's uh, side here. He had some very interesting information going on on his page there. Uh, today, U.S. enhances combat readiness at Kadena Air Base, Japan. Uh, some 20 F-15 Eagles, the E-3, the KC-135, and HH-60 uh, on the tarmac. They're getting ready for a possible strike on North Korea. Don't forget also, they moved in those stealth fighters, the F-35s, into Japan as well. So there's a lot going on, but something that really caught my attention was another clip there that uh, Lorenzo loaded on his page as well, and that was a train was spotted in Septenburg Station, Germany. Here are some updates. Uh, this train here was actually bringing tanks back from the front there with Russia. Now, from what we understand there, just from a little glimpse of this, is that the uh, Germans, they said they won't spend the 2% on uh, the NATO uh, military expenditure there. And so in this particular video right here, we see that uh, Germany was shipping some of their tanks back home. Whether or not all this is true or not, don't really know. Doesn't look like a big uh, movement to begin with, but it looks like that they are backing down a little bit. That would certainly be nice. That's some of the objective that we have of trying to expose as much news as we possibly can. 
is to, in some hopes, that we might be able to avert a war, especially a world war. I don't know if the elites really care what we think about it, but nonetheless, the more public exposure we can make of these things, sometimes maybe it does help a little bit. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov holds a joint press conference with U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson, both men being very frank and very forthcoming about their thoughts there, but it does seem to have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, anyway, special responsibility Moscow and Washington bear for maintaining strategic stability. This will include business-like pragmatic discussions on arms reductions, Lavrov said, and also um, uh, and other parties may want to try and take advantage of these tensions. We are open to this dialogue and not just dialogue but to working together in areas of mutual interest. We understand each other better after today's talks, uh, Lavrov noted. There's a low level of trust between our two countries. Tillerson started off in his uh, opening speech there with the press. Uh, he began, uh, as he began his remarks, the world's two foremost nuclear powers cannot have this kind of relationship, he said. Then uh, he stated Moscow and Washington should end tit-for-tat strategies which can provoke tensions. Moscow and Washington have agreed to create a working group dedicated towards solving low-level problems. We both believe in a stable, unified Syria, the U.S. diplomat said, uh, but he also stated that, um, uh, that Assad plan, and uh, that, that Tillerson said Washington's belief that Assad planned and executed a chemical attack is conclusive and said it is not the first time Damascus has used chemical warfare since 2011, and Lavrov disagreed. Russia insists on an objective investigation. So they're still divided on that. And from what I was hearing, uh, my wife was saying to me that uh, President Trump is now saying that the United States is not going to invade Syria. Well, I think that's about a day late and a dollar short on stating that, as we brought out to you already, the U.S. has already got their troops in Jordan, uh, military equipment working with the Jordanian government, and have crossed into Syria. Uh, of course, the mission is to take out ISIS, but nonetheless, and they've also brought the strategic uh, move of bringing military equipment into Lebanon as they were meeting with the Lebanese officials back February the 27th. Now that that uh, equipment has been ported there at Beirut, Lebanon. So it's very suggestive to say that the United States military is ready for a ground invasion into Syria. Uh, but what's even more concerning is that this has been going on for a long time. Uh, Putin also, though, according to Sputnik, meets with the U.S. State Secretary Tillerson, Tillerson Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov in the Kremlin. Now, I'm sure because he wasn't a, a willing to meet with uh, uh, Mr. Rex Tillerson, but I think what made the difference was there is some headway being made in these talks. Uh, but however, unless they come to some kind of consensus over Bashar al-Assad as the president of Syria, that's not going to change very well in the near future. And Russia calling uh, the United States' hand on possible further uh, faith, uh, false flag chemical attacks in order to blame it on Assad is something as well that is putting the pressure on the West not to allow the Syrian rebels or any of the other factions in this region here to do such chemical attacks and then blame it on Assad because all eyes are watching and all eyes are expecting that it is a fake. And of course, too many mistakes were made on the ground. The White Helmets trying to decontaminate children with their bare hands, knowing that a drop of sarin gas would kill an adult. This was a big red flag to, uh, to those that are spe uh, specialists in the field, knowing that you do not decontaminate children barehanded uh, unless you're planning on dying right along with them. So there was a lot of issues that were there that let us know that these were uh, definitely fake videos that were being done by the famed White Helmets. But then again, I think it was Vanessa Bealey that noted they got an Oscar in Hollywood uh, for best acting. I guess they're pretty good at acting, aren't they? Anyway, moving on to other news there. Well, actually, not other news, but more on the same line of this very report here. This is on uh, uh, the website project. Uh, censored.org and very interesting article and my wife shared this with me earlier today declassified 1986 CIA reports suggest um, uh, long-standing plans to destabilize Syria blow it up here to give you a little bit better view on this 
uh, April 9, 2017 and March 2017, Mint Press News reported on a declassified CIA report that exposes that contrary to popular belief, the U.S. government had has had plans to initiate regime change in Syria as far back as the 1980s. The report is entitled Syria uh, Scenarios of Dramatic Political Change and was written by the Foreign Subversion and Instability Center in July of 1986. The stated purpose of the document was to analyze for purposefully provocative reasons and scenarios that would uh, uh, the, the overthrow of the Assad regime. Although the conflict in Syria, often referred to by the cooperate media as a civil war, is often said to have begun in 2011. New information illuminate, uh, illuminates the 25-year history of the U.S. efforts to destabilize the country. This newly declassified report uh, uh, elucidates the U.S. intentions in Syria and sheds light on the country's current conflict. Um, they also go into this article here, I believe is, is in this article originally. They speak about how that uh, General Wesley Clark exposed this is in 2001. Uh, let's see, right here it says, uh, now in, uh, Amy Goodman that the U.S. had plans to topple the Syrian government as far back as 2001. The 1986 CIA document, however, clearly points to plans to topple the Assad regime and U.S. complicity in the war that now rages in Syria. The document states that the Sunni-led government in Syria would be most beneficial to the U.S. and suggested that Sunni dissidents would likely set the stage for a civil war. Uh, the report goes on to suggest that the Muslim Brotherhood, considered by many countries to be the terrorist group, should be considered the best option to lead a Sunni revolt against the Assad regime and stated that they would be a part of their long-term goals in Syria. Notably, the Brotherhood is one of the leading forces in the Syrian opposition today, has received over a billion dollars from the U.S. since 2011. Think about all that. And you know, Barack Hussein Obama, from what we've seen in other reports, is that he's part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Maybe that's why they had him as president of the United States. Put the guy in there to help get all these radicals going. What do you know? As of April 2017, the uh, corporate media has completely ignored the new re uh, relations that prove the U.S. has sought to destabilize Syria since the 1980s, considering that this document exposes U.S. support for and suggests its complicity in the incredibly bloody conflict that has raged in Syria for the past seven years. It is unsurprising that this story has only been picked by independent news outlets. The U.S. government has a long history of supporting regime change in countries whose governments are not friendly to the U.S. interests. So matter uh, the effects that such actions would have uh, on innocent civilians. Assyria is only one of the most recent examples of this, of course. Very troubling information that we see, and more and more the United States clearly involved, as uh, John Stockwell has always stated, and, and as a former CIA director uh, has stated, director of operations that is stated in his own book when he came out of the CIA, that the U.S., constantly is working to destabilize democratic countries for their own purposes. In this case here being the Sunnis were, were the ones they chose for their revolt, that's nothing shocking to us knowing that the Vatican prefers the Sunni nation over the Shiite any day of the week. That's the ones that are loyal to them. So therefore, it only fits into the plan that much better. Turning to a biblical note of this, something that I said I wanted to share with you and go back to, Daniel chapter 11, go back again to verse 39. This is something that really has troubled me. I shared this a little while back because it was something that most people overlook. And that is, and he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god. Now, who is that he shall, uh, shall deal with the strongest fortress? And as I brought out, this was Great Britain. Great Britain, who is actually still the uh, ruling party over the United States. By the way, don't think that the United States is some independent nation. Unfortunately, we're not. We're not as independent as we think we are. We just think that we're independent. I would love the U.S. to be totally independent of Rome, of Great Britain, and everything else, but it's just not the case there. But anyway, they work with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god. Now, you have to look at that in Hebrew. It's really interesting the way this is worded here. It's Im Eloha uh, El Nechea, okay? This is nothing to do with God up in heaven or anything. This is a foreign God, a God from another country on the earth itself. So who did work with this 
group there that was a strong fortress at the time. Well, if you go back to World War I, we know that Britain decided to destabilize and topple the Ottoman Empire there in the Middle East, correct? Now, who decided to restore their relationship with the British Empire to have some effect on the Middle East? It was none other than the Catholic Church. They did this long before the uh, First World War. They started back in the late 1800s, and they mainly did this because the Ottoman Empire opened the, the rights for the Jewish people, or the, uh, the Hebrew people, I should say, the right to be able to go back to their homeland there and purchase lands within sight of their ancestral homeland. This is what the Ottoman Empire did after many, many years of not allowing them to do that. And so there were Hebrew people, former uh, long historical Israeli people returning to their homeland to buy lands around Tel Aviv and Joppa and even up around the Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee as many call it. They bought huge tracts of land there. Even in Germany they began to buy up land there during the Ottoman reign. Well the Vatican didn't like this because the Vatican wanted to get control of Jerusalem from the beginning. So they began a plan to work with uh, the British government. They came up strong. This foreign god, as Daniel speaks about, it was the Vatican. Remember, he claims to be Christ on earth, the vicar of Christ, uh, the charis filiae dei, which is over his crown, which means instead of the Son of God, or in the place of the Son of God. So this is your foreign god that it's speaking about here, the Roman Pope himself. So World War I was initiated by Rome and that's exactly why it got started, so that the Vatican could get control of the Middle East. But notice what it says, And whom he shall acknowledge, and shall increase in glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for a price. Now he does cause them to rule over many, and it is Rome, who is also the uh, father of the United Nations, also the European Union. The Vatican is strongly involved in all of this. This is why recently we saw the Vatican playing a major role with all the European leaders saying that they needed a new inspirational uh, boost to bring life back into the European Union because the popes of Rome were the ones that created the European Union but as well the United Nations. That's why you saw the Pope so active in the United States a couple of years ago. Uh, speaking at the United Nations, speaking before Congress. He, they help him to rule over many. See, that's what's interesting. And, and shall increase uh, the glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for a price. Now that's the part that's interesting right here. You have to look at the way it's worded here. Ve'adoma yachalech bemechia. All right. The very word that is used for the word land, most of the time we think of this as referring to Israel. They're going to divide the land. So we think of the state of Israel and a Palestinian state, and this is what's breaking God's command. But in this particular scripture, it's unlike the scripture we have in Joel about dividing of the land. This one here kind of entails not just Israel. It can include Israel, but it's including all that land throughout the Middle East right there. Because the word Adoma is used. It's literally, and they will divide up the earth. Not the land, not Haaretz. Israel is always, when they speak of Israel as a land, it's always spoken of as Aretz, or Haaretz. That is the land. Not Adoma, the earth. Okay, or the ground, the dirt. They're going to divide up the earth. All right? Now, that could have far more reaching implications than you ever thought about. That could play out also as part of the New World Order, uh, the 10 regions of the world, something that many biblical scholars have probably never even considered before in Daniel's prophecy because no one's paying attention to the fact that it doesn't say land, but rather the earth. See, the Adama Yachalek. See, they're going to divide it up, and of course, for a price, for money. They do. And that's exactly what happened. I pointed this out in a video not long ago, but I'm really beginning to realize this goes out even further. Because after World War I, they divided up, they created a new uh, countries there. Syria was one of those countries, Jordan, 
Israel. Israel was divided up constantly, still being divided up to this day. They never stopped dividing up Israel, right? But they made a new country called Jordan. They made the country called Syria. We have Iraq. All these countries, they were being divided for gain. And that's how the Jordanian country came into being. Because remember, that was supposed to be, according to the British mandate, part of a Jewish homeland. Well, it got all mixed up and everything, and they decided, well, Hussein's son, King Abdullah II, deserves a big chunk of land for helping us defeat the Ottoman Empire, so they give him that, that part. Now, keep in mind, I am not for the greater Israeli project uh, that the Rothschilds have envisioned that they want to blame on the Jewish people for going and conquering all of our neighbors and taking all this land. That's not right. That's totally wrong. And that's not what the Jewish people, the true Jewish people, do not want to take something that was not given to us by the promise of God. Now, of course, we were driven out of the land because of our own sins, which is our own fault, nobody else's fault. But God did promise that we would come back to this land in the latter days. But he didn't say for us to go and take and kill all of our neighbors in the first place, especially the Syrians. My gosh, have we forgotten as a Jewish people that we are related to the Syrians by birth? Do we not know that Jacob, who our very name, the country of Israel, gets its name from, our founding father, Jacob, who later was, his name was changed to Israel, married both Rachel and Leah from the land of Syria? And yes, it was a part of a family tradition because that was family, but they were Syrians. So, you know, by relation, we are cousins to the Syrians. And God never told us that we could go and take the land of Syria or any of these other lands that are around us for that matter. So, no, I'm not for this greater Israeli project. And maybe we wouldn't have as much problem with Iran if we weren't always talking about trying to wipe them off the map as well. You know, it is tit for tat. And there is an argument out there saying that they never said they would wipe Israel off the map. Now, I, I'm not going to go into that because I know there's still a lot of lies that have been told on both sides. And yes, Israel does consider Iran a major threat to Israel's existence. But maybe if we just lived in peace and we only get live, because I, again, I am for one state, not a two-state solution. All right, but let's back up. I keep going into this, and I really want to kind of clear some things up. I want to show something to you, though, as well in this prophecy. So before I get off on a totally separate tan tantrum there, let's go back to this prophecy here. Now, they're going to divide the land for a price, right? Now, watch what happens. Verse 40, And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. All right? Now keep this in mind. In verse 40, that is lands in plural. This is not an invasion of Israel. This is an invasion of the Middle East, period. It is the Middle East. He shall enter also into the beauteous land. Now that's speaking of Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown. Yes. You know, Egypt, Libya, you know. Iraq, Syria, Greece. Oh, we didn't think about Greece, did we? Not militarily, but they've overthrown Greece as well. <coughs> Let's watch what I'm talking about. Sorry, I've been getting very sick here lately, so my, my voice is hard to speak right now. Uh, but anyway, what does he say? The king of the north, okay, the, the, the coming of many horsemen with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. You're just passing through. Well, Israel's the ultimate goal, right? He shall enter also in the beauteous land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom, Moab, the chief of the children of Ammon, and he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries of the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power of the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps." Now look at all these lands that he's just spoke about, the ones that are going to be toppled, and the ones that do not get toppled. And this is what kind of confused me, because I knew that Edom was modern-day Rome. Obadiah clearly identifies Edom as modern-day Rome. So let's take a look at the map, all right? Now, modern-day Rome is Italy. Right next to Italy is Greece. Then we have Turkey, we have Syria, we have Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, Libya. Now he says that Edom and Moab 
and the chiefs of Ammon, they will escape. They will not be destroyed in this whole, well, I call this the ring of fire for the Middle East, for this whole ring of fire right here, right? Well, look at this then. Edom is Italy. But isn't it interesting? Greece has been totally destabilized. Turkey has this fake coup that the United States did with him to destabilize this country as well, right? Now let's kind of zoom in a little bit. Libya and Egypt both, the United States has destabilized them again. And of course, we move in. Iraq, he enters into the, remember it says he enters into the land, yes? Yeah? So he takes out Iraq. Now he's working on taking out Syria as well. But he says that Adam, well, Italy, over here, the Romans, and he says, Moab and the chief princes of Ammon will escape. Well, Moab are your Palestinians in the West Bank. They're not going to bother them. And they're not going to bother the chiefs of Ammon, which are your Jordanians. By the way, this was Moab and this, excuse me, Moab and this was Ammon back in biblical times. And the Moabites are...